I'd love to turn it over to our panelists and give them the chance to do a better job introducing themselves than what, what I've done, because um, I know they have a lot to share. So I think we'll begin with Sandra. And would you each please introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about where you are right now in your career, and then a little bit also about the path that has led you to where you are. Yeah, of course. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Sandra Chung. I graduated at, um, at Wellesley in 2020. I was in international relations and a Middle Eastern studies minor, so a major and a minor. Uh, right now, I am preparing to go to grad school. I am part of the Wrangell program, which um, I don't know if you guys know a lot about it. So there's two State Department programs where basically State Department pays for two years of your grad school, and then you fast track to the Foreign Service, and then you serve for the in the foreign service for about five years and then either you can continue or you have a break to leave so that's on the track that i am right now um so right now i am preparing to go to grad school and i will actually be going to tufts fletcher so i will be in the area if anyone is interested or wants to see me in person or have any questions about anything about the foreign service about the wrangle and grad school in general thanks sandra katie would you like to go yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Katie Judd. I uh, graduated Wellesley in 2011. I was a political science and Latin American studies double major. Um, and I just, just like three days ago, finished my first tour in the Foreign Service, um, where I was serving as a consular officer in Kingston, Jamaica. Um, prior to joining state, I worked for several years in DC first as a um, USAID implementing partner and then on the communications staff at the Global Health Bureau of USAID. Um, so I do have some experience in, I guess, civil service with government as well. And right after I left Wellesley, I received the Albright Fellowship to um, do an internship overseas. So I did that in, in Brazil and then stayed there and did a master's degree in Brazil as well. I'm looking forward to meeting you guys. Go ahead, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire Smolik. It's great to see so many of you on the screen. Uh, I am an 06 graduate, so a purple class for all you purple classes out there. Uh, I joined the State Department just about 13 years ago, and I've had a combination of domestic tours and tours overseas. Um, in Washington, I most recently served uh, doing South Korean affairs. And prior to that, I served overseas in Germany. I also worked on NATO issues within the State Department, and I've had tours in Stockholm and Afghanistan. And um, it's been a whirlwind so far, it goes really quickly. So happy to engage with all of you and discuss the experience. Thank you. Um, well, I think for now we can keep going in the same order, but you know, please feel free to mix it up however it works for you. But the, my next question is for each of you, how did you decide that you wanted to join the Foreign Service? What did that um, discernment process look like for you? Yeah, oh, I, I can go first. Yeah, I, well, for me, what I did was during my time at Wellesley, I actually did two State Department internships. So I did one um, internally. So State Department, of course, uh, Katie and Claire, they know more than I do just because, you know, they've been working and they're very experienced, but State Department, they have one base in Washington, DC, where they do like very like sport poly-centered and we have one, of course, all across the world, right? Which are our embassies and consulates. So I did one internship at the Democracy of Human Rights and Labor, um, East Asia Pacific. So one internship really focused on US democracy, human rights policies. And then I did one abroad, which was actually based in China. So I did one in the US consulate in Shenyang, China. And based on those two internships, um, I really got to meet a lot of foreign service officers. I got to see the type of policy work that I might be doing if I were to join as a foreign service officer. I also got to see the life abroad, right? Um, since I worked at a consulate abroad. And so after that, I decided, oh, you know, I really liked kind of going to work. I really enjoyed going to work every single day on my internship. And I was like, uh, I think I can kind of see myself do this. So that's how I really kind of got into um, committing myself into joining the Foreign Service and pursuing something along those lines. 
Yeah, Sandra, that's amazing you had that experience during your Wellesley career. I think um, my path to the Foreign Service was a little more meandering. And um, I had always had an interest in diplomacy and international affairs, so it was sort of in the back of my mind. But particularly when I was doing my internship and then master's degree in Brazil, I came across several Foreign Service officers um, and had the chance to interact with them and sort of hear about what they were doing more on a social level. But I knew that the work sounded interesting. Um, and when I came back to DC, the same thing, like working at USAID, you work very closely with FSOs. I know we're focused on the State Department here, but um, there are foreign service officers in uh, USAID, Department of Commerce, Department of Agriculture. So it's not just um, state overseas. And um, that sort of made me really interested in applying. And I kind of, I went for it kind of on a whim. I was like, you know what? I think this is something that I'd like to do and just kept pursuing it um, because it kept sort of working out for me. Um, but I do think that the, as Sandra was alluding to, having some time to interact with FSOs in my work was really, really helpful to me because I wasn't so clear on what folks do at embassies overseas. Um, and so it was helpful to have the time to hear about it, I suppose. Yeah, I 100% agree. The um, ability to do an internship really will give you a good taste for the type of work. Um, and especially if you can do just that an experience where you're in Washington and then overseas, that'll give you a really good um, understanding of what both the State Department in Washington does and then how the embassies implement the policy that is being made in Washington. So highly recommend that. Um, I'd say my experience um, at Wellesley was as an international relations major, and that's what led me to the Foreign Service. I took the exam while I was at Wellesley, um, living in BB. The night before the exam, there was a fire alarm. Um, still managed to pass the exam. So what I say to people is you can take it as many times as you want. Just take it. It's free. Um, you'll get a taste for what it's like. And um, internships, obviously, I ended up doing a Fulbright in between graduating from Wellesley and doing a master's program before I joined. And I think that experience um, gave me a good perspective as well on living abroad, um, using languages, et cetera, which is you know, a really important skill set for when you join the State Department. Claire, um, you were kind of alluding to my next question, which is kind of a little more logistics about what the exam was like for you and Katie. Sandra, I know your path is gonna look a little different. So some of these questions won't apply to you, but I definitely will get to more about your, um, your Wrangell experience. But, um, but Katie and Claire, if you wouldn't mind telling, telling us a little bit more about the exam and sort of the logistics of, of that process, what it looked like for you, knowing that some of the people here are probably looking ahead to like charting a path to the exam. Yeah, I'm happy just to chime in quickly to say Katie's experience is probably more relevant because she's done it more recently, um, but the general framework hasn't changed, so I'm happy to talk about that. There's a written exam um, that you can take now. I believe they're even doing it um, virtually proctored during COVID. At least some opportunities were offered that way. Um, if you pass the written exam, there is an oral exam that follows that in person. Um, they've now returned to in person, I think, within the last week or two, um, they're doing the in-person interviews. After that, you go through a whole vetting process, a medical clearance, a security clearance. So the timing, um, you want to give yourself plenty of leeway. Uh, it takes you know anywhere from nine months to well beyond that if you've lived overseas and you've had a lot of um, overseas experience. Um, there is something called the QEP. So there is an interim process where you do um, essays, which I believe are in advance now, but Katie can correct me because she's more recently done it. Yeah, so my experience was roughly the same, Claire, yeah. Um, and I think when I took it, I, I had an invitation to submit the qualifying questions, but now you fill them out while you're taking the exam or when you're registering for the exam, I believe. So I would say my in my experience, um, that first written exam, it's it's both difficult and easy to prepare to. 
prepare for, difficult in that it covers a wide breadth of um, materials, easy in that Wellesley, I think, prepares you well for that kind of thing as a liberal arts school. Um, I, I think the exam focuses mostly on like geography, history, international studies kinds of things. But if you're sort of well read, as all of you are going to Wellesley, um, I wouldn't be as concerned about that. I think there are some practice tests online and I think I did one. What I did work on, and then the qualifying questions are sort of like any sort of application where you just speak to your experience um, and how it's relevant to the job. Uh, what I did spend a little more time preparing for was the in-person interview, which is a whole day long and consists of a group exercise followed by a short ambassador brief and then um, interview and hypothetical question section. And finally, a um, case management section where you're given a bunch of materials and asked to write a quick memo. Um, so a lot of sort of simulation and it's a long day. Um, but there's a whole test prep guide online that you can use and and yeah they're in person as of a, just a couple of weeks ago um, in in Washington DC and sometimes they'll do them in other locations in the USA as well. Um, yeah, I think that hopefully addresses your question mostly Nicole. <laughs> That's great. And I'm sure once we open it up, you know, students can ask more specific questions. Um, Katie, you did mention, you know, at, at first, maybe not knowing what, um, what foreign service officers did in embassies overseas. And so I wondered if you could give us some perspective on like, well, especially just coming off your first tour, like what you actually did in your first tour and, and this and what that tends to look like when you first get started as a foreign service officer. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to, um, you know, U.S. embassies overseas do. A, I think the the scope is much wider than I would have imagined. So in addition to sort of implementing policy directives from Washington, managing a bilateral relationship with the country, um, in the case of Kingston, Jamaica, there were representatives from most law enforcement agencies in the US. Um, there's a whole host of staff dedicated to just the management and functioning of the embassy community. Um, and it needs to be staffed sometimes with, you know, US citizens, not just folks that are locally um, in country there. So, you know, um, that's just a few to like of the different functions. There's a pu um, public affairs section, which um, manages sort of sharing news and information, but also um, providing grant opportunities for folks to come and study in the US and facilitating the Fulbright scholarship and sorts of, and those sorts of things. And then there's the consular affairs section, which is where I was working. And my job changed sort of with COVID, I would say it's probably not the typical experience of a first tour officer, but um, a lot of what we we're doing kind of stayed the same. So in the consular section, I started off um, like 90% mo like of consular officers working in the visa section. So issuing visas to foreign nationals in Jamaica that wanted to travel to the US for any reason under the sun um, from from pleasure to medical issues, to students, to temporary work visas, to company transfers. And there's a different section of the law for each one of those things. Um, and pretty quickly I moved over to American Citizen Services, which um, you know, provides what my boss liked to call the full suite of services for US citizens overseas from cradle to grave. So we do things like register new babies who were just born who are US citizens. Um, we also provide services to American citizens who've lost their loved one overseas um, and need death registration papers to be able to close their affairs and, and settle things when they get back to the US and, and you know, transport the remains for a funeral and burial. Um, we were working with destitute Americans who didn't have anywhere to go and needed to get home. Um, and I did what would normally be a typical rotation of like nine months there. And then I was going to go back to visas and then COVID hit. 
And I just stayed. I was there and we were trying to help everybody get out. And then once the borders closed, we were assisting Americans that stayed. And um, we I took a like care package to a guy who was in the hospital with COVID and wasn't getting anything from the local government. Um, like just so much random stuff. It's almost like a little bit of a social work job. Um, I would say sometimes, but also just like issuing emergency passports to people whose passports got stolen or whatever. So just everything under the sun. <laughs> Claire, I wondered if you could um, look back to your first tour and, and share a little bit about yours. Yeah, happily, mine um, was somewhat atypical because I ended up being in Stockholm. I don't think most people um, when they join, um, end up in a very small post like that in a quite remote um, consular section at that point. Um, I would just say everybody starts off, no matter what their background, for the most part, start, starts off in the consular section, just the way Katie described, either doing visas or American citizen services. And um, you probably do that for at least two years, if not four. So it's just something to be mindful of when you join. Um, if you've explored the career a little bit, if you go to state.gov, there's great information there. But we have what are called cones, which are basically areas of specialization. So you have the consular cone, exactly what Katie was just describing. Um, you have the management cone, the people who make the embassy run um, when you're overseas and do a lot of our administrative processing when you're back in Washington, um, public diplomacy, so all of our public outreach, and then con um, sorry, economic and political work. Um, and both of those, um, while similar, obviously there, there's a policy bent to the economic work, but obviously helping US businesses while you're overseas, um, and for political work, interacting with the government, um, monitoring transitions in government when you're in a place um, where that's highly volatile, for example. So my for first tour, even though I'm not consular coned, I'm economic coned, was doing um, visas for two years. And then after that, I ended up doing a combination of economic work and political work, both, again, as I said, in Washington and overseas. And I have to say, um, I think that is the most appealing part to me of this whole career is the diversity of work. And if you're somebody who wants to sort of have a, a tasting menu uh, as a career, which I happen to really enjoy that aspect of it, um, it certainly gives you that. So you can spend two years in Stockholm, um, then you end up in Afghanistan watching a government transition, not very um, seamlessly, unfortunately. You're back in Washington working on NATO issues. Um, you end up overseas again. So that constant change, if that's something that appeals to you, there is definitely space to be able to do that within this career. Thank you. Since we're talking about, you know, sort of the beginning of, of careers, I thought Sandra might be a good time to turn to you and hear just a little bit more about your experience, like how you discovered the fellowship and what your application process was like and, and advice that you have for students who might be considering it. Yeah, of course. So I actually learned about the Ringel and the Pickering um, fellowships from a diplomat in state. I, I, forgot, I, I don't know if that's exactly, but State Department, they come to Wellesley uh, like three times a year and they uh, like the PD section, the, so the public diplomacy officer who was in tour for Massachusetts that year comes and they basically present on State Department internships, uh, these the fellowships and different State Department experiences. Yes, diplomat in residence, that is the name. Um, DIR, DIR, right? Yeah. And so I kind of learned about the Pickering and the Wrangle in my so sophomore year and I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then I kind of forgot about it. And then my junior summer when I was actually at the US consulate in Shenyang, all the foreign, so I worked for the political economic section, the Paul Econ section, and all of the foreign service officers, there were a Wrangle and Pickerings. And so they really pushed me and was like, you know, like this is gonna be awesome. Um, this is an awesome program, we should definitely do it. And I know that you're interested in the foreign service, so why not? So um, that's kind of how I applied. So this was actually my second time applying. I applied last year, didn't get it. And then I applied this year and got it. So even if you don't get it the first time, please do apply again because there's merits to applying again. Um, I just 
also want to say that. I think in general, what's important about the Ringel and the Pickering is that it really is a program that is trying to get um, different types of people with different types of backgrounds, whether it be race, ethnicity, or international travel. And it's a program to promote diversity in the State Department. So I think especially, um, and one of the things that I thought about was, I think a lot of times we don't talk about this, but being a US diplomat is about representing the United States, but it's specifically representing the United States abroad, right? So why do you want to represent the United States abroad? And why is that important to you, right? And why is diversity important to you in terms of that relationship is I think a pivotal for the Pickering and the Wrangle. Being able to articulate that in your essay in the interview. So I think uh, Katie talked a little bit about just the oral exam. So then that's what they call the second rounds of the Horn Service Office exam, officer exam, and the Wrangle and the Pickering, they basically mimic that um, just on purpose because even if you're a Wrangle and a Pickering fellow, you still have to take the Foreign Service Officer exam. And so like the questions, they're very similar to the oral exam and that's how I actually prepared for it. Um, like looking on the oral exams online, looking at different sources. But one of the key factors is being able to articulate why you why you want the picker in the wrangle. Not because it pays for two years of your graduate experience. Of course, that's a great one, right? Um, grad school expensive, they're paying for it. That's awesome. They're giving you stipends. But outside of that, why is it important for you to represent the United States and for that representation to be diverse and to actually represent the population. So being able to think about that is I think really important um, in terms of preparing or just applying for the Ringel and the Pickering and also having different international experiences, I think. Uh, whether it, it can, you know, it can be like just being on the International Relations Club. It can be, an, it can be being part of the Albright Fellow, right? It doesn't have to be actual going abroad because going abroad is expensive. It's tough for low-income students. Um, and, to, and I totally understand that. And so it doesn't have to be like actual, let's say you traveling across the United States, but maybe doing an internship, um, you know, like with the UN or with just USAID or even with State Department in Washington, DC. I think being able to kind of articulate that a lot. So the wrangle is interesting because we also do one congressional internship over the summer before grad school. So I will be doing that this summer. And so a lot of my fellow, uh, like fellows, a lot of the fellows in my cohort, they also have congressional internship backgrounds, right? And they're able to articulate why domestic policy and how domestic policy and diversity affects representation in US diplomacy and US foreign, uh, foreign policy. So I think just kind of being able to articulate that, think about that and why you wanna join the Foreign Service are kind of the pivotal things in terms of the best advice I can give. And I'm happy to talk about it more if anyone has any questions, like further questions. Sandra, since you're giving such great advice right now, I'm gonna um, ask you one more question, um, especially since you had those two State Department internships and I am sure we have lots of people here now who are very interested in getting State Department internships. So I wondered if you had any advice for that process or any thoughts to share. Yeah, of course. Um, I think in terms of my State Department internships, so I actually did, so for me personally, I think I had, uh, because I, so I'm Korean American and I grew up speaking Korean in the household. And so my first State Department internship was very Korea heavy. So I worked on a lot of North Korean human uh, rights policies. And then I also worked on China and Vietnam, but still it was really heavy around North Korean human rights policies. One of the things that I would say is being able to articulate in your essay like why specifically that office? So if you actually go into USA Jobs, uh, which is the platform that they use for tutorial internships, is that you submit your resume, like your essays, and then um, your personal statement, and then they like go to the actual State Department website, and you're able to choose the exact offices that you want to go to, right? So I think my first year, my first time doing this as a sophomore, I applied the democracy. So the Bureau of Democracy and Human Rights and Labor, East EAP, East Asia Pacific, Pacific and then I applied to uh, the embassy in Saudi Arabia. I know that sounds kind of like crazy, but they're two different things. But what I did was I focused a lot on my language abilities because I was taking Arabic. And then I focused on kind of Korean. 
actually, you don't have to do that. What I recommend is being able to articulate exactly why you want to be in that bureau actually helped me because at the end, that's that's what my boss told me. She was like, oh, I picked you because you were able to articulate why you wanted to work for democracy, human rights and labor. So uh, I think language abilities are important. They're a huge plus, but it's not something that you need. And I think that's like a kind of sometimes a misconception in terms of internships. So being able to articulate why that bureau, what you want to do and why you care about that issue was really, really important. Because then after I got my first internship and I was able to articulate into my second internship how I knew about State Department, what it meant for me to work um, on these foreign policy issues, why I want to intern, that, that really helped me get my second internship at the U.S. consulate in Shenyang. So I think being able to also leverage all of your experiences, like for example, my first year summer, I did like a two month volunteer, volunteer thing where, um, where I worked with sex workers in South Korea. Um, and I was able to, it was very, it wasn't, it wasn't very long, but I think it was meaningful for me personally. It was something that everyone was kind of like, what are you, why are you doing this? All right? Like, why are you doing this? But I was able to use all of that experiences to get my internship at Democracy of Human Rights and Labor. So a lot of times people come to me and they're like asking, oh, like what internships do I have to do to get into State Department? There is no right answer, right? It's able to do what you love and be able to articulate that and why that matters to US foreign policy and why that matters to that specific bureaus and the skill sets that you can bring based on those experiences. So I think thinking about kind of those things and being able to articulate the reasons why you want to, um, how you can help and why this matters to you personally, because people I think get moved by those things, by that being able to articulate your experience and why you would want to do it. Um, yeah, and Claire and Katie, I, I don't know if you guys have like read the State Department internship. I know that some people are, they like read the internship. Um, applications so if you guys have any perspectives on that I think that'd also be a game because changer because you know I've always been on the other side or I am getting interviewed I have never actually assessed anyone's internship application I think your advice was perfect from having read applications that you show passion um, about what you're doing and if you can apply it to um, the job that you want great but if you can you know, explain, for example, I had this experience in South Korea working with sex workers, um, why it was meaningful to you. And in this case, you did a perfect job clearly applying it to democracy um, and human rights. So that's exactly it. it connects your experiences to the position that you're applying for. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add that I think um, Sandra, you're articulating and Claire is sort of validated as well as just, um, in my limited experience, people tend to care that you have answered the question and answered it succinctly. So I think I've seen sometimes where it's very easy to read a question and try to, to bring it to some other thing that you care about. And it's like, sometimes what they're really asking for is what is written in the question. So just reading your application or your qualifying experience question, um, answers, you know, if you're applying to take the test and say, does this answer the question that they're asking? And I remember um, I, I sent a draft of my questions to my now spouse, um, we were dating at the time, and he read them all and he's like, Katie, this doesn't, you're not answering their question. Like you're talking about what you want to talk about. And that's great if you can do both, but prioritize answering the question too. <laughs> Claire and Katie, I would love if you could tell us what you have found most rewarding about your work so far for you, Katie. And if you have any um, like anecdotes to illustrate it, we'd love to hear some stories from your time abroad too. I'm happy to go. Um, 
So obviously the diversity of work, I think, again, um, as we were saying, everybody starts off doing consular work and whether that's something you're actually interested in, you know, doing or not as your cone, um, I actually found it really rewarding. I didn't, um, I'm economic cone. Um, so this was going to be my one experience doing that kind of work in all likelihood. I suppose I could return to it someday. Um, but helping people truly, you know, as Katie was saying, Americans in distress, um, people at really difficult points in their lives, helping Americans in that way was really rewarding to me. Um, I'd say from the policy perspective, um, sort of my bread and butter work, um, it's, it's being able to convey uh, U.S. policy overseas and really have an impact and reading, you know, the CNN or New York Times or Fox News headlines and knowing the backstory behind it, because you often had some part in it. It's not a huge part. Um, you're not, you know, the ambassador. The ambassador is the one who's actually out there, um, you know, delivering messages, making speeches, etc. But you're in the background, one the one writing the bullet points that they're using, you're the one who's talking to Washington about whatever the White House's perspective or a different department's perspective is on something. So you're really shaping the image um, that the United States is portraying overseas. And to me, that's important. You may be doing it in the background. You may be doing it in a more public facing role. Let's say if you are in public diplomacy, you may be the person standing at a visa adjudication window talking to um, a citizen, a foreign citizen, but I think that to me has been the most impactful thing. I also had a chance to work in our operations center. So it's our crisis management center. And again, helping people in distress at these really difficult times in their lives, either you know your state department colleagues or just an American citizen who calls completely in distress to be able to be the one um, working with your team that facilitates either that person's safe return to the United States um, or a connection with a loved one, that has been really the most meaningful part of it to me. Yeah, that's interesting, Claire, because um, I, I found American Citizen Services work to be incredibly rewarding and at the same time, um, quite draining. So I spent about almost two years working exclusively on American Citizen Services and um, it, it can be tough to be on call, like you're saying, because on the other end of the phone when Claire is calling, there's somebody at Embassy Kingston who's got to go look for the person who's lost or what have you. Um, and I think what, what I found interesting, so Claire alluded to the cone, so I'm public diplomacy coned, um, and this is my consular tour that I just finished up. Um, and I wasn't sure how I would feel about it, but when you work in public affairs or communications, you're trying to reach a, generally trying to reach a very broad swath of people, like as many people as possible with your message. When you're working in American citizen services, it's the person that you're working with and that is it. And so the guy that I mentioned um, who had COVID very early on and was receiving like very inadequate healthcare from the Jamaican, um, you know, health facility and uh, we, we were like not sure he was really gonna make it, um, but like being able to help him through to the point where he got better and was able to leave the country um, because he was one of the first people with COVID in the country, they had put him in this isolation ward, they took away all his stuff, like there was all this um, additional work that we had to do because he was essentially being held by a foreign government. Um, like, I was really, really happy when he sent me an email and was like, I'm back in Boston. <laughs> like, thank you so much. You know, and that's only one person, but I really, truly feel like, along with the team, you know, the ACS team, I was able to make a difference in his life. And the same for, um, you know, I just have a couple that I like really remember, but. Um, we had these five kids who got basically dropped off with their abusive father in Jamaica and their mom, you know, wanted them back. And um, they, the kids were eventually taken into foster care in Jamaica. And it was like a long, long saga. And they finally were able to return home. And 
um, actually, you know, we were able to hook them up with social services um, in the town that they were returning to in the United States. And so moments like that, where you see different like local government working with um, federal government to provide services to people that really need it. I think those are the moments that I've, that have carried me through some of the really challenging um, times. Thank you for sharing those stories, Katie. Um, and I think you've already probably sort of answered this question, um, but because my next question was about what you find most challenging about your work, but um, sort of a different spin on that is what, what do you think people should know about a career in the foreign service that maybe they, they wouldn't know from looking at the website or from what we've already discussed? Well, I think that my experience of the Foreign Service changed um, a lot when, when COVID hit. And so I went from being an easy two hour flight from the United States to, you know, not being able to leave a very small island. <laughs> um, and, and Claire has more experience with this, I think, as you serve overseas in different places and you're further away from home, um, you know, versus, where I was posted, which was really easy to get back and forth. Um, you know, I mean, it is a challenge. You, you do miss, even during this period of COVID where I think everybody has sort of experienced this, but you do miss milestones and, um, you know, like wrapping up my home that I lived in for two and a half years, I, I, I had this surreal feeling of like, it's almost like I was never here, but at the same time, I had so many life experiences here and I'm kind of a different person coming back. And I think that, I mean, that part is part of the draw. It's exciting to be able to do different jobs um, over the span of a career and still have the stability that, you know, a government job offers, um, but it's hard. Um, you're gonna put down roots no matter what. And maybe I'll feel differently after my fifth tour, but. Um, it was really tough leaving and how final it felt. You know, I always, I have ties back to Brazil. So that's the other place that I've lived abroad and I, I know I'll be, I'll go back. Um, but I don't know when I'll be back to Jamaica. Of course, I have friends there that were, we were posted there after 10 years, you know, abroad, but um, it's unlikely that you, you know, would go back. So that was challenging. Um, Sometimes I've found, and maybe you get used to this more too, like there's a lot of red tape. <laughs> there are a lot of layers. It is, you know, it's government work. So you have to respect the chain of command and you have to go through your proper paces with everything. And as you learn the system that gets easier, um, but it's not, um, it's not, I don't know. It, sometimes things can feel like they're moving at a, very, very slow pace. And when you're working with another government, like when we were working with the Jamaican government overseas, then you're like trying to put together two bureaucracies and that's just, you know, mind boggling. So things like that can be hard um, for sure. Yeah, I 100% agree with Katie. Um, as you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, the expression, the ship of state. Uh, it's a very large ship and it doesn't maneuver very quickly. Um, it gets where it needs to go, but there are a lot of people making that ship run. So yeah, you do have to sort of pace yourself when it comes to dealing with the bureaucracy. Um, you do start to learn the ins and outs of it. I don't know that anybody ever fully masters it, but it's, it's true. It's something to keep in mind when you do join a government organization. Um, I am spending this year on a sabbatical fellowship um, and the project I'm working on through a grant, um, a very generous grant is to look at the experience of foreign service family members. Um, and I think that's something to be mindful of if you do intend to have a family um, either with you, if you intend to be single, if you intend to be married, if you tend to have children in the foreign service, all things to think about. Um, I've lived all of those iterations, um, started out single in the foreign service, got married, had a child, 
And it's a very different experience, obviously, to be single and to be able to go wherever. Um, there are posts, obviously, that are unaccompanied where you cannot bring family members, you cannot bring children because it's just too dangerous or unsafe. Um, and so does that become prohibitive for you once you do have a family? So just to be mindful of the people who are with you or not with you, as Katie was alluding to, um, the milestones that you might miss back home, um, how you intend to keep connections. Thank goodness we live in an era, you know, if COVID was going to have to hit any time, it's the era of Zoom. Um, and so that really has made it easier. Um, but Katie's right, you can't just, you know, hop on a plane home, COVID or not, if you're halfway across the world. So it's just something to be mindful of as you think about this career and this lifestyle, because that's really what it is. It's a lifestyle. Thank you. Well, I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for everyone else here to ask questions. So I am going to turn off the recording and um, if anyone wants to unmute themselves, enter questions into the chat, whatever you feel comfortable doing, um, please feel free to engage.